Professor Eleanor Shapston, who is the faculty's uh, good heart visiting professor this year, but whose connections with Cambridge are both multiple and long standing. She was an undergraduate at King's, and in the 1990s, she was a teaching member of this faculty and a fellow of King's College. And in 2006, she was appointed by Common Accord of the Member States as an Advocate General. Justice, a position in which she served between 2006 and 2020. So, as part of her very generous contribution to the work of the faculty and this year, she's going to give a series of lunchtime seminars, of which this is the first one, where she's going to give us an inside view of the workings of the Court of Justice. Sort of thing that you will not find in the textbooks but which is absolutely fascinating. So today we start with the first seminar. She's going to tell us what it means uh, running a 24 language court. And I'm sure we are all very looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Unfortunately, we are operating under very tight time constraints. So there will be hopefully a little bit of time for questions at the end, but we need to finish unfortunately at five minutes to two because it is an MCL class immediately afterwards. So without any further delay, let me leave the floor to Advocate General Sharpson, Professor Sharpson. Well, hello. Dear, dear Professor Alvors Lawrence, dear Albertina, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I want to begin by drawing the contrast between the court in any other place that you have ever heard of and the court in Luxembourg. So, you know, if you're in front of a national court, essentially everything is happening in a single language. Okay, I know very occasionally there might be a witness who needs to give evidence in a different language, but the basic rules of the game are we've all got a shared legal culture. We're all coming from the same place. We have the same background, the same training, and we're using the same language. And indeed, a lot of the time we're using shorthand because we don't even need to explain concepts which are common ground. We can just focus on the contentious parts of the case. My next words would be compare and contrast, because at least to my knowledge, the Court of Justice of the European Union, the CJEU, or to some of its friends in the UK persistently, the ECJ, which is not an official abbreviation, but never mind, to the best of my knowledge, the CJEU is the only international court that truly tries to operate fully in 24 procedural languages. The court in Strasbourg, for example, has two parallel main languages, English and French, but the court in Luxembourg, at least in theory, has 24 languages. And it still, of course, has 24 languages post-Brexit, because our friends in Ireland are still very much part of the EU. There used indeed to be a rather two-edged joke that was told in Luxembourg and in Brussels when I was a younger lawyer than I am now, which where the question was, who are the Europeans who have English as their mother tongue? And the answer was the Irish. Think about that one for a bit. It tells you quite a lot about the respective reputations of Ireland and the United Kingdom as being committed to the European ideal. So, CJU really, really different and really unique. What does this actually mean? Well, I make no apologies for borrowing the analogy which is used by the court's own directors of linguistic services when they're trying to get across the idea of how the court operates. And they say, basically, it is like an hourglass, you know, one of those old fashioned hourglasses where you turn it over so that the sand runs through. So there's a big wide bit at the top and then there's a very narrow bit and then there's a wide bit at the bottom. It's just like that. So the wide bit at the top is the 24 languages coming in. It then funnels down into one, I repeat one, unofficial, not official, unofficial, 
langue de la maison, language of the house. The language of the house is French. Full stop, it's French. There have been several attempts to try to get it to drift across into English, particularly in relation to the general court, because a very high proportion of the work of the general court actually originates in English. So it seems a bit daft to go and translate it from English into French, work on it in French, and then put it back into English. But so far, the institution has resisted the temptation to move. The language of the house is French. And then when you've court's finished doing its bit, you get the bottom bit of the hourglass, because the output of the court, the advocate general's opinion in cases where there is an AG's opinion, and in any event, the judgment or the reasoned order bringing the proceedings to an end needs to be translated out in principle into all 24 languages. Note the words I just said in principle. The court has been trying to cut corners for almost as long as I can remember. And one of the corners that it cuts is that if the case is deemed really to be extremely unimportant and uninteresting and merely to be a repetition of earlier case law, you sometimes find that the court's been a bit sneaky and that instead of translating it back out into 24 languages, it, the case will exist in French and in the language of procedure. It has to exist in the language of procedure, obviously. And you can occasionally get really caught out by that because you will occasionally find that the court has said something which in hindsight, in retrospect, turns out to be really interesting. And the text only exists in French and Lithuanian, which for most of us is not going to give us access via two languages into what the court said. So what are we talking about in terms of volume of work, in terms of, of numbers? Everything I'm about to say has been culled from the annual report of the court or the overview of the court. It's up on the website for the year 2022. Uh, it may, you may think, why on earth is it 2022? We're most of the way through 2023. Well, it doesn't come out until about February or March. So it's always you know, kind of one year running behind. What are we actually talking about in terms of the volume of work? Well, if we're looking at what was going on last year in the Court of Justice, there were 806 cases that were brought, and the Court's very proud of the fact it managed to close two more cases than that, 808 cases closed. I can hear them cheering from here. Uh, the General Court had more cases. The General Court had 904 cases that were brought and 858 cases that were closed. So every time you hear the word case brought, you also should be hearing in the back of your mind translation, right? Because it's going to be important. How important? Well, I fished out for you what the court itself says about its linguistic services. This is on page 22 of annual report 2022, the year in review 2022 at a glance. The glance is not a very pretty glance. They say cheerfully, 24 languages of the case, that means 552 language combinations. I'll trust them on the mathematics. There is an old saying that judges can't count, udex non calculat, and I certainly can't do the arithmetic in my head to see if they're right about that. It sounds like a very big number, but it's probably right. How many people do they have to do the work? Well. They have on the staff, they have 612 lawyer linguists. I stress lawyer linguists because in principle, any, if in Cape, every single person who works as a lawyer linguist is both a qualified lawyer and a qualified linguist, right? And the course also makes use of freelancers who are invisible here as I know a number of them. So I don't know how many we should be adding on, but they're also freelancers. How much translation? Well, they went through the million page mark some time ago. This 2022 report tells us that there were 1,281,000, so 1 1.28 million pages to be translated. That is a very big number. And they proudly say, well, they, they almost managed to translate everything that year that they were meant to translate. 
There's a shortfall of about 2,000 pages that should have been translated in 2022, but they didn't get around to it, so they've begun at the beginning of 2023. That's the written side, okay? That's the written pleadings, anything which is on the printed page or perhaps on the, on the electronic page. But of course, you also have hearings. Hmm? You don't have hearings in every case, but when you have a hearing, you can't have a hearing without interpreters. 71 full-time on the books interpreters for hearings and meetings. I'll add that it is invariably the case that they need to get in freelancers as well. They cannot cover what they have to do in hearings with the permanent staff. And you see that when they rather coyly explain that in 2022, there were 526 hearings and meetings with simultaneous interpretation. I stress the word simultaneous because sequential interpretation is actually easier because you can make notes of what's just been said and then interpret it. But of course, it takes twice the time because you have to listen to the speaker and then you have to have the interpretation. And the court is big on trying to save time. So we're talking simultaneous interpretation which as far as I'm concerned is white magic. I mean, you really need an extraordinarily two-track brain to be able to listen to a legal pleading and simultaneously turn it into a legal pleading in the other language. By the way, the interpreters, unlike the lawyer linguists, the interpreters are not legally qualified. That may surprise you. I have been told by interpreter friends that the kind of brain you need to be able to do the trick of simultaneous interpretation doesn't usually accord with the kind of brain you need to be a professional lawyer. I offer no observation, save to say I've actually tried to do simultaneous interpretation and I thought my head was going to explode. Uh, they, having said that, the interpreters do prepare very, very thoroughly, unlike the interpreter who is hauled in at the last minute in a busy magistrate's court in this country because you've got a defendant who only speaks uh, Urdu, right? Unlike that, the interpreters are given the file in advance with written pleadings. They're given preparation time. You can imagine they need it because let's suppose that you have something to interpret about the system of refunds on dried tomatoes. I mean, are you going to know the vocabulary? No, you probably don't know it in your own language. So you're going to dig out the legislation in parallel. You'll have it in the language that you're going to be interpreting into. You'll have the parallel text of the regulations in the other languages you're interpreting from. And you will have gone through and you'll have done at least some basic work. You know, what on earth, when they say that, what do I say? Because you don't actually have time to think. So you have to have prepared it. All of that in terms of the, the the preparatory work. And the freelancers, when they do come, and they do come very often to supplement the full-time staff, they also have to be given the preparation time. So in terms of preparation, this is really the deluxe version of having interpretation at a meeting. Right, that's enough on the subject of some facts and figures. I now need to say to you, uh, and this is a trailer for what I'm going to say in a few minutes, not everything that ideally would be translated is in fact translated. If everything that was put into the court in writing were to be translated into the language of the court French, the figure for pages to be translated would not be 1,281,000. It would probably be something closer to 3 million. And the court would simply grind to a halt. There were not the resources to pay for that, and the effect on the timeline would be horrendous. I'll come back around to that. I want to go, before I start looking at written translations, I want to talk a little bit about the dominance of French as the language of the house and about its consequences. Why French? Hmm? Why French? Well, first, for the very good historical reason that it was spoken by three out of the six original member states. You think about it, Belgium, 
France, my member state Luxembourg, we all have French. So it was an obvious choice. It was also at the relevant time, French was the language of diplomacy. So there was a backup reason, if you like, why French? It was, it was the obvious language. And of course, the UK had absolutely nothing to do with any of this. Winston Churchill in his Zurich speech had wished everyone well, but the UK was no part of the project. So nobody was thinking that English might be a useful language. So it's French. Now, other institutions have, in the meantime, moved across Council, the Commission, the European Parliament, they all make intensive use and extensive use of English. But court has remained the court. Court remains francophone. Now, that has a lot of impact on a lot of things. The first impact is literally on the composition of the court. Because members of the court, people being appointed to the court as members, have to be able to speak French. You will not get through the Article 255 Committee, which is the committee that vets all potential members of the court, you will not get through the committee if you can't speak French, because half the interview will be in French. And that clearly is going to have an impact on who gets to serve at the court. It's also, and this is perhaps an unkind comment, but it also creates to some extent a kind of built-in resistance to change, because if you came through the committee, and you managed to get the post because you were somebody who spoke French. Turkeys do not vote for Christmas. Why should you suggest that things should be changed so that it's only English matters? Well, somebody else might want your job. It's a very, very unworthy thought. You never heard me voice it, but there are other people who have actually said that and perhaps they're not entirely wrong. All right, so it has an impact on the membership of the court. It has a big impact on court staff. It has an impact, obviously, in the administrative parts of the court, because French is the language that people hold meetings in and write memos to each other and emails to each other in. But it has a big, big impact on the way that the chambers of each of the members of the court operate, because each member of the court can surround him or herself with his own little personal team, a team of four referendaire judicial assistants, plus a couple of assistants to do the administrative side, plus a very nice chauffeur to help out with other stuff and ferry you about. Well, in terms of the legal drafting and in terms of checking documents, you must have people who can read French. You cannot work as a referendaire if you don't read French fast because you won't sleep because all the files will be in French. So if you want to be able to work at the court, working for the chambers in the chambers of a member of the court, you have to speak French. That inevitably skews the distribution of referendaire. I speak as a, oh dear, that sounded terribly like it was statistics, didn't it? But it is a simple fact that probably something like 65% of the referendaire are either French or they're Francophone Belgian, because you have to have people who can write in French. And I do remember I worked as a referendaire at the court before I managed to go back there as an advocate general. I was working for Sir Gordon Slynn. When I joined him, he was the British advocate general. A year after I joined him, he moved across to replace Lord Mackenzie Stewart as the British judge. He knew my work. He asked me one question when deciding whether I would move with him, or whether he would leave me for Francis Jacobs, who was coming in as the new Advocate General. Eleanor, how good is your written active French? I looked at him and rather well, gulped a bit, and I said, well, Gordon, I did get distinction at Cambridge in French. So I hope it's OK. <laughs> and he said, right, he said, you're moving with me. I and mean, that was the sum total of the discussion about whether I could, should be working for him as a judge rather than as an advocate general, because the advocates general can choose the language in which they write. The judges can't have to write in French. I will add that within the chambers, we had an absolutely delightful Belgian 
called Eric van Tinder after. Uh, despite the name, he was in fact really more Francophone than Flemish speaking. And Eric and I had a pact that when we were writing things for Gordon, if Eric was writing in English, he would show me the text and I would make a few suggestions. Yeah? And if I was doing a draft judgment, a projet de motif, I would show him my draft and he would, you know, help a bit before I gave it to Gordon. And I really, really remember Eric used to come into my office and he'd say, Eleonore, c'est très, très bien, tu fais du progrès, c'est magnifique. You're making progress, it's magnificent, it's wonderful. And I'd say, Eric, laisse voir un peu ce que tu as fait avec mon projet. What have you done with my draft? And he would produce a text. He was very polite. He didn't do it in baro. He did it in pencil. He would produce a text and there would be stuff all over it. You know, you can't listen and you can't really say that. No, what, no. So I say, Eric, for God's sake, what was wrong with that sentence? You know, the sentence said the cat sat on the mat. I mean, what was wrong with that? He said, well, you wouldn't have put, you said, you would probably have said on the mat the cat sat in this particular context. So, I mean, all that, all that to tell you that, that if you're working for a judge, mastery of French is something you have to do. So there's the impact on the court staff, there's especially the referendum. There's also the impact on the writing style, because the writing style was derived originally from the French Conseil d'État. And indeed, if you go right back to the early judgments, you will find that disconcertingly, there aren't even paragraph numbers. It starts having regard to, you know, and then you have a whole stream of thinking. And then finally, you discover what the court's going to say. But when you first look at that, you think this is absolutely bizarre. But it is, in fact, copied across directly from the way that the Conseil d'État at the material time was writing its judgments. And I'm also going to mention now, I'll come back around again later, the dominance of French also has the consequence that particularly those of us who are not native Francophone, we resort to using tried and tested formulae. Accepted phrases, building blocks, a bit like Lego, to be honest, right? And we tend to use the building blocks because at least we know what the damn thing means. Somebody who wasn't us put it together 20 years ago and everyone has accepted that you speak about measures that, that entrave, that, that act as a hindrance. To, I mean, I would never have chosen the word entrave, but well, what about it? Somebody else have chosen entrave, so it's entrave. Okay, let's move on to written translations. Written translations. Let's begin with the order for reference. Before we get to the pleadings, let's begin with the order for reference, which will start the procedure for anything that's come by way of reference for a preliminary ruling from a national court. Now, the court has produced a very nice document, which it updates sometimes, called Recommendations to National Courts and Tribunals in relation to the initiation of preliminary ruling proceedings. The current version, I'm slightly touched to see that the current version is still the one that I labored on as a member of the Rules of Procedure Committee, on which I, for my sins, which were many, I sat throughout my time at the court. Uh, so it's the 2019, uh, November 2019 version. And that, that makes an occasional kind of little mention of the fact that we'd like you to be very clear and succinct. For example, it says at point 14, it says, as experience has shown, about 10 pages are often sufficient to set out adequately the legal and factual context of a request for a preliminary ruling and the grounds for making the reference to the court. In your dreams. No, really. I mean, most orders for reference are nothing like as short as 10 pages. And actually writing a 10 page order for reference is a triumph of really, really condensed analytic skill. So they they tend to be a bit longer than that. What this doesn't tell you is that if they are over 20 pages, the question then arises, are we going to translate the order for reference at all, except into French? Or are we going to ask somebody who's in the translation division, who is a lawyer linguist, 
of the right language group to make a summary of the order for reference. Probably the national judge would have a fit if he knew that if he is very long winded, what will probably happen is that his immortal reflections will be summarized by a lawyer linguist and that it will be the summary of the order for reference, which is translated into most other languages. The exception is French. French translation will be somewhere between the original and the summary, because certain, there are certain instructions for things you can take out. So potentially, you can have three versions of the order for reference. And without identifying the case, I will tell you there is a case where the reporting judge and I, as the Advocate General, took a completely different view of the weight and indeed admissibility of the order for reference, which was in one of the lesser known community languages. For the reporting judge, there wasn't enough factual material for the court really to get its teeth into it, and it should be sent to a chamber of three and an order should be made declaring it to be inadmissible. Well, I'm a languages nerd and I kind of sort of knew a bit of the language in question, or at least I could begin to busk it. And I was curious. So I started looking at the original and then I asked my referendaire to help out. I'm basically the original, the point is the original text had enough material for the court to work on. And indeed, it was a grand chamber case, according to me, grand chamber hearing Advocate Jones' opinion. Now, you cannot get two points further apart on the spectrum than chamber of three order of inadmissibility and grand chamber hearing Advocate General's opinion, right? And it did depend what text you were looking at. Just to flag that point for you. Let's move from there, and passing, noting in passing that the court coyly also tells us in the recommendation to the national courts that it should be borne in mind, this is paragraph 17, it should be borne in mind that only the request for a preliminary ruling will be translated, not any annexes to that request. Again, war stories, I remember an early case in which I was the Advocate General where there were about 20 annexes to the order for reference, none of which were translated. And we got to the hearing and the people were referring to a judgment that had been somewhere in the rather convoluted process in front of the National Court. And I said innocently, you said the judgment? Of, uh, yes, they said it's, it's, it's in the annexes to the order for reference. My poor referendaire turned white. I tried not to turn white. I was, after all, sitting officially as a member of the court. I said, yes, yes, thank, thank you very much. I'll check that out after the hearing. And uh, my referendaire came up, offered to commit ritual suicide on the front law of the court. I said, don't do that. I need you. But please go to the registry and find what they've done with the sodding annexes. Because they hadn't even distributed them. They were on the file of the national court because they'd only given us the order for reference and the translation, but they hadn't given us the 20 odd annexes. So please, please bear in mind that not everything that goes in is necessarily translated. That leads me straight across to pointing out that although pleadings are translated, the annexes to pleadings are never translated. Same rule as for an order for reference. So I wonder how many people who write pleadings for the court actually realize that if they put something in an annex, unless they flag up in the main text that Annex 5 is of absolutely crucial importance because it contains the following, and in summary, it shows you that this, right? Unless they do that, probably we go straight over the top of Annex 5, unless we happen to have some time and are curious. This can create very serious difficulties. For example, for example, you will remember that if you have infringement proceedings, it is part of the defense rights of the member state that there has to be a straight line going through from the lettre de mise en demeure, the formal letter of notice, through the avis motivé, the reasoned opinion, and into the application because the member state has to have had the opportunity to respond fully to the case that's being made against it. Supposing 
that you have a case in Finnish, all right? And you have got translated the application. And you have got annexed to that, you have got the pre-contentious procedure. So you've got the formal letter and the reply, you have the reasoned opinion and the reply, and they are all in Finnish. They are not automatically translated. If the member state is contesting the admissibility of a particular point, you have to be able to go and dig this out somehow. Well, as in all institutions, there are institutional shortcuts. I don't know if other members of the court did what I did, but my simple shortcut was, I used to say to my, one of my nice referendaires, please go down the corridor and please talk to your colleague in the Finnish judges' chambers and tell him what the problem is, hand him a highlighter pen, ask him to mark the passages in the Finnish text which deal with this point. And then we will ask the translation division to translate just those two or three pages. All right, so there is a workaround. But the workaround, I think, shows you, it reveals to you just how acute the translation problem is. And you, you, know, you have to spot the problem and you have to work out how to deal with it. Because you cannot suddenly say to translation, here are 70 pages of Finnish. Would you please translate all 70 pages into French on the off chance that there might be something there which will assist me in writing my opinion and will assist the judge in writing his judgment. I'm going to move on. I'm keeping a very wary eye on the time because I do want to give you a chance for some questions. I'm going to move from there, although there are other things that could be said about writing styles being different and all that good jazz. I'm going to move from there to the hearing and to interpretation. I will make as the first point something that may surprise you. It's actually much easier if you're doing simultaneous interpretation to interpret free speech from notes than to interpret a detailed prepared text. Because if people produce a detailed prepared text, imperceptibly the syntax tends to move across to something which is what you would write, but it's not what you would speak. Whereas when you speak, you give the poor interpreter a chance. There's the moment when you draw breath, when you reformulate in your head what you're going to say. I am speaking to you today, by the way, significantly faster than I would ever speak if I were pleading in front of that court. If I were pleading in front of the court, I would be speaking at this speed. I would be saying, my lords, I come to my third point. The third point is this. And I have three submissions to make. One, two, three. It would be short sentences, and it would be at that speed. It wouldn't be at the fastest speed that I think I'm allowed to use in a Cambridge lecture. Right? Time constraint. Big time constraint. There is on the court website, there are some practice directions to parties concerning cases brought before the court. It's under the procedure tab on the website. And they give you stuff about the uh, oral submissions. They tell you very firmly, as a general rule, the speaking time is fixed at 15 minutes. You can exceptionally get an extension of that, but you have to apply for it. And you won't suddenly get it doubled, right? You might, if you say, make a good argument, you might get 20 minutes. Now, I am sorry to tell you that counsel are craven human beings and they like to suck up to courts. And so what tends to happen is before the hearing starts, the counsel are invited in to meet the court and the president does a roll call, who is here and how long you're going to speak for. And it is frequently the case that counsel have said, you know, I need an extension of time, I must have 20 minutes. And then they seeking to ingratiate themselves with the court they say, actually, actually, Mr. President, I probably only need 14 minutes. And the president writes down 14 minutes. Now, what that means is I have a speech that would take 25 minutes. But I think that if I turn the speed dial up, I might be able, and I've been practicing, I might be able to do it in 14 minutes. 
Pity the poor bloody interpreters, right? I mean, how are you going to deal with that? You are meant, again, it tells you in the practice directions, you are meant, if you've got a text or if you've got some notes, you're meant to give them to the interpreters. By the way, they don't get passed on to the court. There's a kind of cordon sanitaire between the interpreters and the court. So you can change what you're saying. The court is never given your notes as a supplement to what you said in court. So, I mean, the interpreter has got something there to try to work from, but of course you may need to chop, chop and change, you may need to depart. And above all, I mean, let's, lawyers are human beings. You may not think that, but really they are. And they get nervous. And they get very nervous when they walk into the big courtroom. They've never been in a place like that with glass interpreters booths down the two sides. And he says, the big, big moment, they're in the court in Luxembourg. They may not ever come here again in their career. And so, you know, they have le trac. They are, they are they're very, very, they got stage fright. And the person before them was a very tall lawyer. So the microphone at the lectern was up like that. And then they come over to the lectern and they, they, they don't think about the microphone because of course there isn't one in their home court. And they open their text. They put their head down so that they mumble, and then they start reading at 200 miles an hour. Now, the interpreter stands not a cat in hell's chance of interpreting that. If they put the microphone so that they're speaking into it, and if they speak at a reasonable speed, then okay, this might work. But I, I have stopped so many hearings during the course of 14 and a half years at the court, and I have sometimes said, to an English speaker, I'm so sorry. I'm English mother tongue. I can't make a note at the speed that you're speaking. And I am sure that our interpreters cannot interpret what you are saying into the various languages necessary for my colleagues in the court. Please, would you slow down? I had lots of friends among the interpreters. Now, Two more things to say, three more things. First, if the interpretation isn't working, the fault lies with the advocate, not with the interpreter. Because the advocate is the person who is in control of what is being said. The interpreter is trying to put it across, but it's the advocate who holds the levers of power. So if it ain't working, don't blame the interpreter, it's your fault. Secondly, relay interpretation. You probably have never thought of this, but let's suppose you have a hearing in the case that's been referred from Lithuania. And let's suppose we have the Greek judge who is sitting. Now, interpreters train in languages which are going to generally be useful. There is not the slightest chance that the Greek mother tongue interpreter is going to know Lithuanian or Estonian or whatever, unless perchance mama was Lithuanian, all right? Only in that rare event will a Greek interpreter know Lithuanian. So what happens is it goes through a relay. So there are some pivot languages as they're called at the court, and it will go from Lithuanian into French or German or English or Italian or Spanish, and then it will go on from there into Greek. Think for a minute what that does, particularly if the advocate is speaking too fast with long, complicated sentences. And final point to make, there's a procedure, you may have come across it called the PPU, the urgent procedure. It is, by the way, known as the PPU, the Procédure Préjudicielle d'Urgence, because it does have an abbreviation in English, which is the Urgent Preliminary Ruling Procedure. But after you've said uprup a few times, you'll understand why we call it the PPU. In that procedure, the court saves time, it saves a lot of time, by not having detailed written submissions from parties other than the parties who are using the language of the case. So if you intervene as a member state, you intervene at the hearing. This puts an enormous weight onto the hearing and onto the interpreters.
to get into the court's consciousness much that in an ordinary case would have happened in writing. And again, I invite you to think about it because the PPU covers some very sensitive matters, the European arrest warrant being just one of them. Think about what it does to the way that the court can handle the case. On very quickly to the Advocate General's opinion and the judge's deliberations. The AG's opinion is crafted in the original language that the, judge, the AG chose to write in. And except for the urgent procedure where I wrote in French because there wasn't time to translate it, most of the time I wrote in English. I did actually write three opinions in Spanish, um, but that was because they were cases I took over from my much regretted Spanish colleague, uh, and I was working with his referent there, and we ended up writing them in Spanish. They're crafted in the original language the AG wanted to write in. They are read and used by the court in French. So you have to know that the French says what you want it to say. It's freestyle writing, therefore it's more interesting, also more challenging to translate than the Lego building blocks. And as the AG, you want the nuance to get across. You don't want it to be more or less than you said, you want it to be what you said. We checked in my chambers, three people checked every draft French translation. My French speaking assistant checked, my referendaire checked, and I checked. And we would get back to translation. We would have a very civilized discussion with translation, trying to make sure that we had the nuance was in fact what we wanted, perhaps making a suggestion, being told you can't say that, but you could say this, and so on. Very civilized. I won't waste the time referring to it in detail, but I'm going to tell you that in one of my early cases, case 24104, Commission against Greece, which was a case all about seagoing tugs and whether seagoing tugs provided maritime transport. Being a sailor, at point 46, I came up with a nice invention to try to make the point. And so I set the thing up with an oil tanker with engine failure that was lying very near to the Lizard Rock on the, on the English coast. And then I organized it. So I had the, the swell and the tide and the wind all pushing this unfortunate disabled oil tanker towards the rock. And I mean, you can see there's going to be a disaster. People may drown. There will be a catastrophic environmental oil spillage and so on. So, of course, the captain of the tanker is on the radio saying, get me a tug, get it here now. We got the draft translation back from, France, from the French translation. We found that inadvertently, because the person translating it was not a sailor, the direction of the wind had been changed round. So instead of being a wind that was coming from the south, it was a wind that was blowing towards the south, which was very helpful because it was keeping the tanker off the rock. But that wasn't exactly what I'd intended. You may be amused to look at that. Let's move on from there to what happens in the deliberation of the judges. First of all, there are notes on délibéré to set the scene before you actually draft the judgment. The notes are in French, your nice referendaire prepares them, and you can discuss them, but you can get help with them if you're the judge, right? There is then a projet de motif, there is a draft judgment, written by a francophone referendaire for a non-francophone judge, usually, to debate with his non-francophone colleagues in French without the insistence of interpreters because there are no interpreters in the deliberation. So once, once it all goes live, he's got to be able to defend it and discuss, and, well, if you're not happy with this, what about that? And all of that is happening. Uh, it's not an equality of arms. If you're a good French speaker, you punch way above your weight. You also have some people who are called the lecteur d'arrêt, who try to clean the damn text up after it has crawled, mangled out of the deliberation and has been patched by the referendaire. Because there are some fairly strict rules as to how you write the court judgment. There's a thing called the Vardimekum, which is 
Well, when I was a referendum, it was like that, so it's probably like that by now. And so, you know, the, again, French, 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 French to the end of their fingertips. French lawyers put that straight. And so, you know, yes, as I was saying earlier, you do tend to use the Lego building blocks. You use the tried and tested formulae. Because if you try to change the tried and tested formulae, that leads inevitably to suspicion. Hey, why did she not simply write what we always write? Why has she got something special and different? What's she trying to slip over on us? What's all this? I mean, why not just use the standard phrase? As a final thought for you, if and to the extent the translation is trying to use machine-assisted translation to speed things up, it is, of course, much easier if you've got a set of building blocks, because then you have equivalent building blocks in the 23 other languages, uh, which will get spat out by the machine-assisted translation. And then your human translator has a shorter route to sort of tidy it up and improve it, but you've got the bones are, are kind of there. I'm going to finish with a very simple story going back to interpreters. Still got half a second for that. Hearing in an English case, my judge, Gordon Slynn, the reporting judge, English counsel, they had both forgotten completely that they were in the court in Luxembourg and they were having a nice chat the way that the bar and the bench have in the High Court in London. And Gordon asked a question and counsel replied. Gordon asked another question and counsel replied. Gordon asked a final question, counsel replied, and then thinking he could just, you know, finish in a glow of triumph, he, he, he looked at Gordon, he said, indeed, my lord, one, one, might, one might say, my lord, that what is source for the goose is source for the gander, my lord. <coughs> of course, Gordon smiled. Everyone else was sitting there with the earpiece there, waiting for the interpreters to tell them what the final sentence from counsel had been. And the interpreters looked absolutely wild. I mean, what do you say? How do you interpret that? All the channels went silent. And the situation was saved by the French interpreter, who was a real old soldier, a real old trooper, right? She was not amused. She leant forward and she punched the button on her microphone. And in a voice so cold that it was possibly about 50 degrees below absolute zero. She said, Il vient de raconter une blague sur la volaille. He has just told a joke about poultry. <laughs> and that was all she said. Now, it was actually a brilliant solution because, of course, there was a slight titter, right, as you've just done. And so counsel was happy. He thought, well, it took them time, but, you know, they got the point. And, of course, we were all laughing at him. What a muppet! What a muppet to think that you could use that sensibly in a pleading in a multilingual court. A few seconds for questions. <laughs>